Buddhism is modern. It's really modern. I don't think you can be as, you can't be as modern as Buddhism. As modern as Buddhism. Now, if you ask me how, how, is, first of all, you see, interesting about Buddhism is, is Zondalam often says, you see, he felt that it's a great bridge between, because if you see the humanity, perhaps one part of the humanity follows adheres to religion. And in that respect, Buddhism is among the greatest religions of the world, such as Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, all that. Buddhism is a great religion. But then other part don't follow religion. Some of them are also atheists. For them, Buddhism is a science of mind, a way of life. So it can bridge the boat. I think amazing in Buddhism, if you want it to be religious, it's religious. <laughs> like, for example, it's very amazing to me. You know, you know about long ceremonies, you know? And I always tease people in the West, you know? Because in the West also you have a little bit of problem with ceremonies and all that, you know? the cultural aspect. So we, we, we I tell them, this is oh, wonderful. What's wonderful about Buddhism, particularly Vajra and Buddhism, if you really know, if you want ceremonies, we've got ceremonies. If you want for 10 days, we've got 10 days. Uh, if you want to like uh, two weeks, two weeks, one month, one month. If you want for five days, five days, three days, three days, half a day, half a day, quarter of day, quarter of day. And then if you want just to, for ten minutes, ten minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Then if you want three minutes, just three minutes also, and one minute also, and then finally, ah. <laughs> Not ah. ah. So it's really there. But it's not about all these forms, like, you know, I remember many students, they're saying, if you don't chant, can I not get enlightenment? No, chanting is just simply a vehicle. These mantras, these things are, but important thing is about presenting the mind. Is that clear? So, Buddhism is really so, like, for example, now in the West, it has had tremendous influence in the mind science, also, particularly in the area of therapy. Psychology and therapy, Buddhism has a tremendous impact. I've done many, many conferences with many therapists so in the early days, so that's very much Buddhist. And now, there are many, many, every works of life, philosophers, everyone, you know, like, uh, uh, beginning to take the Buddhist philosophy has had such an impact in there, you know. So much so that Einstein said that if there any religion could answer the need of the modern Time, he said it is Buddhism. So the great minds realize, really, really the extraordinary part. And now what's happened with science? You see what's amazing is what I said that also in the Tibetan Book of Living Dying, chapter 3, I said that. What the science is discovering now is what Buddha discovered 2,500 years ago. And particularly now, they're very exciting. This is actually His Holiness that Dalai Lama has been quite uh, instrumental in inspiring dialogue with the science and, and uh, uh, very much with science and Buddhism. You know, I think you had Matthew Rika, some of you. Uh, he, I think he may have spoke about that a little bit, about the science. So he's been part of that dialogue. But that is quite extraordinary, because you see, normally what happens with this, you see, uh, scientists believe that when you, like the musicians, you know, musicians, like the people who play violin for 10,000 hours, that movement of that finger affects the brain. It's called neuroplasticity. But now, so it's thought was something connected with nerves and this thing, but now, what's discovered? through mental training, through meditation. In fact, many lamas, some of them my friends also, who've done 10,000 to 40,000 hours of meditation. They found there's really, it not connect with nerves, you don't have to be physical. Before, they, before whatever, science was dealing only on a matter, on a physical level. 
But now they begin to understand the dimension of mind, the impact of mind and body, mind and body. That science of mind body is where Buddhism has had tremendous influence. Can't be more modern than that. And so, in that respect, that you see, they realize, for example, those who have done meditation, if I just I tell you this century, those who have done meditation over 10,000 to uh, 40,000 hours, what they found, they found the parts of brain that form positive emotions are high. And the, the parts of brain that form negative emotions are actually out of order. Doesn't work. Like dissatisfaction, egocentricity, all these things are kind of down, out of order. Is it clear? And also, very amazing things, they develop a tremendous empathy. Tremendous empathy. Empathy for people, their feelings. The, the, the scientists were amazed by how they could read people's emotions, their needs. They were really amazed. Which means also, it inspires very much compassion. His own dilemma was particularly happy. Because normally, you see, in the early days, when Buddhism first came to the West, there was some criticism that Buddhism is, you know, or just a little bit selfish, you just you meditate, you know? You should just go and help others. But then, of course, as, as I said in the Christian teachings, charity, where? Begins at home. It says, love thy neighbor as thyself. So, you must first learn to love yourself, otherwise your neighbor will get some. What a bad version of the love. <laughs> hmm? So you have to first overcome yourself. Love thy neighbor. In Buddhism it says, Take the example of your body and don't harm others. So what's happening is quite incredible that what he's only saw was that actually, you know, he was very happy that actually through meditation, you see that when you do meditation, it suddenly inspires the aspect of you that really brings universal love and universal compassion. Non-referential compassion. Non-referential means, because normally we only love our friends, but not our enemy. We have compassion for the poor, but not for the rich and powerful. When you really go, when you go compassion on a deeper level, you become this level, then you really begin to include, realize, oh, in fact, even the rich are suffering very much. And you know, you begin to realize. So the non-referential compassion, or the, uh, like a universal compassion, begins to emanate. The scientists discover. Then you're more inspired to, you know, engage in action of compassion. You're more than more in tune to help others. So. These are the tremendous benefits there. So, and so, what's incredible, this research show, that in the case of these people who've done meditation for many, many hours, they find that actually, you see, uh, you see, there's a person, there's a really a permanent damage, because they found, what they found was that part of the brain that brings happiness is always lit up. Do you understand? Not only when they're practicing, but also when they're not practicing. So there's a permanent damage. Switch is not working. <laughs> permanent damage on the brain. It means they're always happy. I think one master calls it happiness without reason. 